important part of the content, I guess I would describe it. Um, one of the advantages of the web is that, you know, you can have other than just plain old text content, you can have multimedia content such as images and, uh, and, and so on. And those images really, in many cases, are, are, are real meaningful parts of the content. They add to the content. They add to your understanding of the page. And the example we went over last time was if we were going to do a page about skiing, we showed an image. And our page looked like this. All right. And again, we didn't fill in all the text or something that, that you that you could have, but in this case, you know, we could actually demonstrate that that the person is turning and has their skis aren't flat as they're turning, their skis are on their edge. Now, we could try to explain that in words, you know, but as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So this truly would add value to a page about skiing to, to demonstrate how to properly do a turn. You know, look at all the things that I wouldn't have to explain, you know, if I was doing that. The fact that the edges are, are touching the ground. The fact that the knees are bent, all right? All these things are information that, that come across from the picture. All right, and, and so therefore this is just another sort of content on the page. All right, another way to get your message across. All right, um, and, and images provide that. If you look at any uh, website, you know, um, they could say about performances at the Grammys. Well, okay, they could talk about it or describe it, but if they were to have an image or even possibly a video, that could add so much to the presentation. Um, we all know, of course, that different people learn differently. And some people respond better to text. Some people respond better to image. There's some things that can easily be shown via image that would be hard to explain via text and so on. I guess my point is, is that images aren't just there to make your web page look pretty. They provide, uh, or they can provide important content. And we went over this last time, and our focus was on this sort of image. Image that provides really meaningful and important content to our website. And we looked at the code to do that, the HTML tags to do that. And again, there's an image tag, IMG. The image tag will always at least have two attributes. One of the attributes is the source attribute. And that's the name of the file that the, the image is in. In this case, the image is in a file called ski.jpg. So that's what we have for the source. The alt text is there for screen readers. All right. So for example, for people that um, are visually impaired, oftentimes there'll be a, a software that will narrate the page to them. Well, the screen reader can read those that alt attribute and give at least a little bit of an explanation. You know, it's not going to replace the fact that the person can't see the image, but you know, it'll do the best best that they can. All right. We talked a little bit about editing and so on and so forth. I want to do a couple things with this, uh, or, or maybe one or two more things with this before we move on to sort of another sort of image. All right. One thing that is often done is you'll often put your images in a separate folder just to keep things clean, all right? Just like in your machine at, at, uh, at home, you're not going to have all your files in one place, right? You have different folders or directories for different kinds of files. You have your program files where you install your applications. You have maybe a, a work folder, maybe a school folder, maybe a home folder. Um, under your school folder, maybe you'll have a folder for a subfolder for each class that you're taking, may, or each semester, and then each in each semester you'd have a folder for each class. Maybe in your home folder you have uh, a folder for your finances, your bills, and all that. Uh, and then maybe you have a folder for planning a vacation or, or something along those lines. So for the same reasons we organize the files on our own computers, 
we are going to want to analyze or, or uh, organize the files um, on our web pages. So in this case, let's say I want to put this file uh, folder, I'm sorry, this file in a folder called images. So I'll go here and I'll create a new folder and I'll call it images. And then I'll move the ski picture in there. Okay, so now the ski picture is in the images folder. If I now try and look at that page, I don't see the image. I get that little thingy, which indicates a broken image, means it can't find the image. The browser can't find the image. All right? So, how do we fix that? Well, why did we get the error? Well, we got the error because our code said that the file was named ski.jpg. And because we don't have any directories there, it assumes that the file is in the same folder as the web page is. So back when everything was in this folder, this one folder, it worked because it could find that image in the same folder as the web page. Now it's not in the same folder. It's in a subfolder. So what you need to do is put in the word images and a slash in front of it. Now a couple of things. First of all, that's always the forward slash. Some people will say, you know, some people that maybe have done some work on the command line or whatever will say that you actually use a backslash in Windows to, to designate a directory. That's true, but web pages are designed for across platforms, not just Windows. So you, you always use the forward slash regardless because you never know what, what side your client's going to be on. All right? So you always use the forward slash. This is different than uh, the Windows rules. The second thing is, is this is assuming that the path to this file starts with our current directory and therefore to get to this file we go down to the images folder from this directory and then within that folder is the file name ski.jpg. So now, maybe I didn't save it. All right, now we're back to viewing it again. So whenever you see this, images slash ski.jpg, you're saying, hey, Start out in the current directory that I'm in, go down to the folder called images, and there you'll find the image called ski.jpg. One thing that you will not want to do is something like this. I see a lot of students do this. They'll put in here the full Windows path like this. see documents uh, and settings, blah, 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 blah. This will only work on my machine. When you turn it in and I go to view that web page, it's not going to work. All right? So, therefore, you do not use this, which is called like an absolute path that shows the folders and all that's in. Because that then, if I were to go to look at it or someone were to look at it on a different machine, it isn't going to work. You start, you always start with the folder that your page is in and then go down to a folder. Now if you have something more complicated, if you have, for example, images in a folder that's on the same level as the source, there's other rules of how to get to that. And if you want to do that, I can discuss that in lab. Usually, the typical scenario is you'll have a folder for your site you have your source code in there, and then underneath the source code, uh, there'll be a folder for images. Um, so typically, that, that's kind of what you do. And then you might have other folders for other things, like CSS files and so on, just to organize that. So the bottom line is, it's good practice to create a folder, put your images in it, have the folder contained in the folder that has your HTML pages, and then you'll use always the folder name, slash, and then the name of the image.
All right. Now, I mentioned that, that many images are used to um, provide additional content. All right. We can, we can tell a lot from an image without having to explain it completely in words. Some images, though, don't fit that mold. Some images are really there largely for decoration. All right? They don't really add any meaning to the page. For example, I could maybe have a picture of a snowflake here. Right? It doesn't really tell me anything. Um, I guess it would tell you that you need snow to ski, but if you need to know that, then you know you're probably on the wrong page to begin with. All right. In that case, the image is more of a decoration. All right. Now, some of these decorative uh, uh, images, um, you know, you'll treat just like as image tags. The only difference is, is the the image will be more of a decorative image than a content image. I don't think it's important to split hairs here, you know, because the idea is, is even the images that you have to, to be content, you want to look good and you want to add to the appearance of the site. All right, that's one reason that we put images on there. But there's a special kind of image that almost always is purely decorative, all right, and that is background images on things. For example, if, you know, anyone that has a Twitter account, here is a, a sample Twitter page, all right? And if you notice, as we scroll, there's a background image there, all right? In other words, the whole page has that as a background. That, in my mind, and again, maybe I'm the only one that views it this way, but in my mind, that's a different kind of image than the image of the skier. The image of the skier, you could actually learn something about skiing from. This image doesn't really teach us anything. It's just there for decoration. It kind of sets the mood, though. This is a page about typography, about letters and, and, you know, and how you format words and so on, and the fonts that you use. So there's some writing in the background. Okay, so that kind of gives us, you know, kind of sets a mood, right? Or kind of sets a, a, uh, a, an idea in our head. If we go to, say, another one of these, let's look up someone else on Twitter. All right, here is Olympic skier, Lindsey Vaughn, who recently had surgery done. Doesn't really tell you much about her. It's largely there for decoration. There's a picture of her with the American flag. You get the idea that she's American and you can, if you, if you know kind of the, uh, the thing, you can see, okay, she was in the Vancouver Olympics, and there are skis there. So, again, I don't want to split hairs here. Maybe I'm making too big a deal about it, but there's some images which really add to the page, and there's some images that add to the page really largely just in terms of decoration to make them look good. Now, a couple of things you have to be concerned with, with all images, is that you don't bog down. You don't have overkill. Right? So regardless of the kind of image it is, you want, to, you want to make sure that the page still loads quickly. And you don't want it to be too big regardless of the kind of image it is. Um, I, would, I would argue that's especially true of the decorative ones. Right? Um, if I have a larger image but it is helping me explain my point, I guess I'll be a little more patient if it takes a little longer to download. If I have an image that its sole purpose is to decorate the page, then eh, I'm going to be less, less likely to be um, uh, patient if it, if it slows down my page to download. Does that make sense? 
All right. Uh, go ahead. Is there a standard, like, you should only have your page so many pixels? No, you see, and, and that's, that's the thing, and that's one of the tough parts of web development. The question was, is there a standard, like, how big to make the page? Um, no, because especially with uh, the advent of, of, uh, of, of heavy usage of mobile devices, you know, people could be visiting your uh, website anywhere from, you know, a phone that's real tiny like this to a gigantic monitor. And really one of the challenges of web development is to make your page work in all those environments. We'll talk a little bit about that, some of the strategies that you can take and, and so on. But the short answer is, nah, not really. You know, that, we, can, we can maybe make some assumptions and we can make some guesses and all that, and we'll do that throughout the term. But ultimately, we have no control over how the site's going to be visited. And therefore, our job is to make it as good as we can in any platform. All right. So let's go back to... This one, the first Twitter one for the typography person. Do you see any problems with the use of the background image? They actually use two background images. Yes. Yeah. It's a little bit hard to read, especially in this case, where you have text sitting, whoops, text sitting on top of a background image. All right. This background image, I think, looks okay, and I think it looks good. All right. But this, where you have the text sitting on top of that image, it makes it hard to read. So that's another concern about you know overkill with these these background images. Uh, in addition, maybe the fact that these two background images look so so much the same, they're both writing, might also be a little confusing as well. So. One thing with any of these sort of design techniques is you want to uh, avoid overkill with this. If you're going to use background images, use them very judiciously. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to add some uh, a background image to our page. Now we can add background images really to any element. We'll start out by adding it to the body. In other words, to the whole page. Let's go and let's look for let's look for snowflake clip art. All right. Go and let's save this image as. We'll put it in my folder. And we'll call it snowflake.jpg. I'm going to copy that so that I can give credit for it. Or we will try to remember to go back and give credit for this. So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to put a background on my page. Now, one skill that you should get off the top of the, right off the bat, is deciding where you're going to make the change. In broad terms, are you going to make the change in your HTML or in your CSS? And again, the idea is if you're talking about how it looks, the change is going to be in CSS. If you're talking about adding content, then it's going to be in HTML. Well, this is just sort of a background image. This isn't really adding any content to our, our page. That's one of the reasons I sort of distinguish between the two kinds of images. So therefore, I'm going to put it in my CSS code. So I will go style like this. And I will say body 
background. Remember, we used the background before to put a color in here. Now, instead of putting in a color, we're going to say URL, parentheses, quotes, and then the path to the image. And that image is in the folder called Images, and it's called snowflake.jpg. Alright, so assuming I typed everything correctly, let's go and look. And there we go. Alright. We'd have to imagine how this would look if there was other text on the page. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something that web designers often do. I'm going to include what's called Greek text. Alright. Greek text isn't really Greek. Alright. Greek text is like fake text. In other words, if I am working on this web page, maybe someone from our sporting goods department is going to write up about skis. Because I'm a web developer. I don't know anything about skis. right? I know how to do HTML and CSS. All right? So maybe someone from our sporting goods department is going to write up about skis. But they may not be done with it yet. Right? You know, Lindsay Vaughn's recovering from her surgery, so she doesn't have time to write our articles about, uh, about this. So what I'm going to use is I need something to sort of fill the place. I need sort of a placeholder. So that's why we use Greek text. So if you Google Greek text, it'll give you some sample text that you can use. And I can go here and I can say, all right, give me two paragraphs of Greek text. And it gives me these two paragraphs of dummy text that I can copy and paste into my web page. So I'll put that fake text into a paragraph. Now if we go and look at this, we'll see what our page will look like with some dummy text in here. Now, we, yeah. I used a fig caption. Okay. Well, we can take a look at that. Yeah. All right. Now we can see it, it doesn't really look good, right? Because we, you know, the 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 black lines of the snowflake sort of get in the way of the text. All right. Well, what can we do? We can do a couple of different things. One thing we could do is I could put a background color on the paragraphs. All right. So I could go in here and I could put in my CSS file and say every paragraph has a background of white. And that helps because where the text is then, we don't have the image peeking through. All right? We have a solid white background. So that's one thing that you can do. And in fact, if we go back to that Twitter page, that's kind of what they do, right? They have this big background behind there, but for the most part where the text is, has, is on a white background. So that way you don't see the image, you know, underneath the text. 
All right. So that's one thing that you can do. You can mix and match these styles to kind of put a background of, uh, under the text that is a different color. If you get fancy with CSS, you can actually make it semi-transparent. That's kind of a cool thing to do. And they, they probably talk about that in the book, and we'll probably talk about it at some point in class. But that's a, that's a little, bit, uh, little bit early for that. Now, the other thing we can do is we can go in and sort of fade the image a little bit. All right? In other words, we can make the image look, uh, look instead of being very dark, solid black lines, we can sort of fade it using any sort of, of photo editing software that you might have. So I'll go in here and I'll edit it. And I'm in paint. Which really does absolutely nothing for me. So I'll go in and open it with Right, and, and I'll set it to be brighter. And again, so I'm kind of getting a watermark kind of approach or, or look to it. So I can play with the contrast and the brightness of it. And then I can save the image. And again, I did it just using this application because that's the one that was loaded on this machine. But just about any photo editing application will have the ability to, to change the brightness and the color. That's, again, if that's something that you want to do, we can look at that in lab. All right, so now if we go and look at this, we'll notice that, hey, it looks more like sort of a watermark behind it. And we could even probably get rid of the white paragraph if we wanted, and our text would still be legible. All right. We can still kind of see the image underneath it, but the text is still legible. All right. Now, this particular image, because it's a simple image, um, is only like 80 KB, which really is not that much to add to a page. The other thing to keep in mind is the way that browsers work. If I had multiple pages and they all had this background on them, uh, it would only download that image once, all right? So the first one, it would take a second to download it. Um, probably not even a second, but it would take a little bit of time to download it. But subsequent ones, since it's already downloaded the image once, it, 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 there's no need to download it again. So that's one way we can accomplish a background image, all right? Another thing that we can do is we can use a tile for a background image. All right, I'm going to go make a copy of this guy so that I can keep that first example. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to look for some background patterns. Here, in fact, is a little background pattern maker. I think I've used this one before. We can pick the symbol that we want. All right, let's make the symbol like that. Let's use this symbol. Let's set the color. Let's make it. Actually, let's look for the image first. Let's see if they have a snowflake. Well, no real snowflake. I guess we could pretend one of these is a snowflake. Yeah. We'll say that's our snowflake. All right. And we can go and set the color for this. And we can make, we can switch between the foreground and background. So we can make the background 
light and we can make the foreground darker if we want. Am I doing the app? I think I'm doing the opposite of what I want to do. Like All right. Oh, we can go and we can add a texture to it if we want. All right. Now we can go and save this. So it saves it as a PNG file. And it probably put it in my downloads folder. So I'm going to cut that and paste it into my images folder. And now I'll go in and I'll apply this background to the second version of my page. So the name of my image is no longer Snowflake, it is this. Let me copy that, put it in here, and if I go and save it, I did not want to do that. I can open up my images too, and there we have that, all right? Which again, um, you know, I might have made it too dark of a color. I could have made it more pale, and the text might stand out a little bit more. I could go in, and I could put a plain color behind it, and uh, that would, uh, um, that, that, that might help a little bit, all right? Now, I could also hey, I could also put a, 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 a background color around the paragraphs like I did before. One second. Notice how that pattern repeats. All right. The image is really a small image. It only takes up, well, 36 KB. But, and the image is only one of these iterations. But the way background images work is, unless you specify otherwise, it tiles to fill out the whole screen. So it's like you have little, little, little linoleum tiles that you put together, and the image is such that when you put together the tiles in a grid, it looks like one continuous pattern. You had a question? What is, can you repeat the question? Um, I'm going to divide the question. Okay. Okay. Would I bother with the or would that be, would that be open? Um, that's something you'd have to try for yourself. Yeah, you, you have to, you'd have to play around with it and try it. The nice thing about this is, especially when we start talking about um, saving our CSS in an external file, is that you can go in one direction, and if you decide that you want to change it, you only have to change the one CSS file, and that change is rippled throughout, uh, throughout all your pages. So, yeah, you'd have to make that call. You'd have to make that call. Um, you know, um, one thing about web design that I'll say is that really, there aren't too many things that I would say are rules in web design. It's more like they're guidelines. There's, there's, you know, things to be aware of, things to look out for. But really, every project is a project 
uh, unto itself, you know. Um, I could probably find many different web pages, you know, I could probably create, define a whole bunch of characteristics of a well-designed page, and then I could probably find some pages that are good that bend or break some of those rules. Why? Because, well, the situation warranted it, you know. It's like they say, you know, know the rules so that you know when it's okay to break them. And it's the same idea there, you know. Um, you don't want to clobber the person over the head with images. You don't want to make your pages too big to download. But try it out and see if it works in your situation. All right. Now, I don't have to do this for the whole body of the page. I could actually put that background image on any element of the page. So, for example, I could change this. Instead of having the background on the body, I could have the background just on the H1. In which case, my page would look like that. So there's a, there's a uh, background to that H1, but not the entire page. So I can pick and choose a stuff that has a background, so I don't have to make the entire page have a background. I could say H1s and H2s have that background, or have a different background for H2s. Again, with the thought in mind that you don't want to have overkill. All right? And that's exactly what that guy did with the Twitter feed, or Twitter page. Regardless of whether you like it or not, the body has a background image, and this, whatever this happens to be, has a background image. All right? And the two, uh, you know, they're, they're, one thing has this background image, the whole body has this background image. Let me go and let me put that back on the body, because I want to do the next example with this. All right, so I look at this and I say, well, I kind of don't like the way the text shows up against this pattern. So I'm going to do what I did in the other example. I'm going to give not a background pattern for my paragraphs, but I'm going to give a background color for my paragraphs. So I'll go in and I'll say P background green color white. So it'll be white text on a green background. Oops. So everything will match, right? Because the background image is green and now I made the paragraphs green. Well, If you're a kid that had the 64 or 128 box of crayons, as opposed to someone that had the 8 crayon box, you know that there is not a color green. There's a bunch of color greens. All right? And that's green. Does it go with the background? Uh, I don't know. All right? It would be nice, ideally, to match that color exactly. And there's some photo editing tricks that we can do to do that but we're going to pretend we don't know those, all right? What if I want a different shade of green? What if I want, in this case, I want sort of a lighter, paler green, all right? So can I type in there for color, background, sort of a lighter, paler color green? No, I can't. There's a number of different name colors. There's a whole bunch of them, actually. If I go out and Google that, we'll see... that there's a whole bunch of them. Chartreuse, aquamarine, dark green, 
dark khaki, dark olive green, dark sea green. Now that might work. All right. But in addition to the color names, because even with those, there's still going to be a finite list of color names. There's way more colors than there are name colors. Maybe, for example, the sea green is what I want, but maybe a little lighter than that. All right. That's where we come into these, what are called hex codes. And these hex codes are a different way to describe a color. There's actually, there's actually several ways to describe a color. We're going to focus on um, at least a couple of them. The one is with the name, where you can specify the name, and if it's one of these names, you might luck out. The other way is via what's called the hex code. Now, the hex code works like this. Imagine we have three lights, three like spotlights, all right, that are all focused on a common spot. And one of those spotlights shining here is red. One of the spotlights shining here is green. And one of the spotlights shining here is blue. So imagine these three as being spotlights that are shining into this circle on the page. Now imagine that we can turn those spotlights to one of 256 different positions. Zero position means it's turned completely off. 255 means it's full blast. It's the reddest of the reds. The greenest of the greens, the bluest of the blues. All right. Then somewhere in between, it gets progressively darker from as you go from 255 down to zero. So 255 is the reddest red. If I go down to 254, it's a little darker red, a little darker, a little darker, all the way down to, you know, 10, which might look very close to black at such a dark red. All right, and then all the way down to zero, which is black. So, I can get, I believe, 65 million combinations with these three things. It would be 256 to the third power, if any of you are good at doing math in your head. I think that's like 65,000 color combinations. Simply by varying all the different colors and by combining it. For example, if I were to turn the red and the blue on full blast, the color I would get would be purple, right? Because red light plus blue light equals purple, all right? If I were to turn the blue down, let's say I have both of those a full blast at 255. If I turn both of those down, or I'm sorry, if I turn just the blue down, I'll get a more reddish shade of purple, all right? Until if I turn the blue all the way off, it's just plain red, all right? But as I turn blue up again, it'll be getting more and more purpley until it's finally purple. Likewise, if I turn the red down, it'll be a bluer shade of purple. So let me show you what I mean, all right? And we'll do that with the background of the paragraphs. And before we get a combination that we like, we're going to go through some really ugly combinations first, all right, just to demonstrate how these work. Now, these three lamps are in this order, red, green, blue. If you've ever done anything with digital cameras, sometimes they'll say the, the color scheme is RGB, red, green, blue. And you have two letters, two numbers or letters for each color. Each of these digits can be anything, can be a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. This is called a hexadecimal numbering system. Hexadecimal means base 16. All right. Um, 
because we normally work in a base 10 numbering system, we don't have a number. We don't have a single digit for 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. All right? Or 15, rather. Therefore, we use an A for 10, a B for 11, a C for 12, a D for 13, an E for 14, and an F for 15. So, in our decimal number system, the numbers go from 0, 0 being the lowest number to 9, 9 being the highest two-digit number. In hexadecimal code, 0, 0 is the lowest hexadecimal value of two characters. FF is the highest. So FF means that light turned all the way on. Zero, zero means it's turned all the way off. So if I had this, FF, zero, 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 that is going to be bright red, the reddest of the reds. Because the red's turned all the way up, green and blue is turned completely off. So FF is the highest it can be, 0, 0 is the lowest it can be. Now, if at this point you're starting to get a little confused, I'll fast forward and give you a little spoiler, all right? If you really have a hard time getting your head around this, there's charts that will help you out, all right? But it is good to understand this because you might want to tweak a color. You might have a color that's almost just right and you want to make it a little darker, all right? So it's kind of good to know this and kind of good to know how it works. All right, so let's go in here and let's make the paragraph, just as I said, pound sign FF0000. You put the pound sign before it just to tip the browser off that this is a hexadecimal code, that that isn't a, a name of a color. All right, so notice like with the names of the colors we just put in red. This being a hexadecimal code, we put in the pound sign first. So. Pound sign FF0000 is red full blast. So if we go and save this, and look at this, all right, the background color on the paragraphs is red. Now, if I put purple, all, uh, if I put the blue also, full blast, red, green, green is the next two, blue, that will be the color purple. If I put all of them at F, what do you suppose it's going to be? It's going to be all three colors blazing as high as they can. It will be white. All right. If I turn them all off, it'll be black. All right. What if I made them all the same? What shade, what color would it be? It'd be a gray, right? Because it's equal amounts of those. It's between everything on full blast and everything off. So it'll be a shade of gray. Um, in this case, since A is a higher value, it'll be a lighter shade of gray. All right, it won't be a dark gray. If I made all those threes, it would be a dark gray. But this will be sort of a light gray. All right, if I made all of them threes, that's a lower number than an A. This will be a dark gray. Now, if we wanted to fiddle around with this, we know the color we want is going to be greenish, right? Would you say that, it, let's say we wanted to match this color exactly. We wanted to match this color exactly. Is that a lighter green or a darker green? Probably a lighter green, all right? So, it's going to be closer to white than black. So, I can start out and make it pure green. Zero, zero, FF. Zero, zero. That'll make it pure green. And that'll be, it'll look like how it did before. Ooh, it's not very good. I can then go and I can make this closer to white by manipulating these. Oops. 
that didn't make much of a difference. Let's go up to All right. We're very gradually getting it a little bit different. Now, I would guess there's a little more blue in this than red in that particular color of gray. So let's go up to All right. That's probably a little too blue. We could play around with this and eventually you know, we have a 1 out of 65 million, I think, chance of getting it right exactly. Now, there's tools that we can do to, to make our job easier. But the bottom line is if you understand those codes, you can go and you can fiddle with the colors to make it look kind of the shade that you want to. All right? So that's the second way to express colors. All right? The first way that we saw to express colors is simply through the name. The third way is through these hex codes. The, the red, green, blue hex codes. Now the good news is, is that if you can't remember all this stuff, I could go in and simply copy that code for light sea green and paste it in. And it does the work for me. All right. I still don't like that. We still could play with it a bit to get it the way we like. Next time what we'll do is we'll, we'll work on this a little bit more. Um, for the next little while we'll be, we'll be hitting largely CSS stuff and how to have more control over our CSS and how to have more control over our colors and, uh, and, and how to choose a good color palette for our page and so on. All right? Questions? All right. See you over in lab.